the American chestnut tree is really part of our history and part of our heritage. It was one of the most common trees in, in the Eastern Forest. One out of every four trees was an American chestnut. It's a very large tree, a canopy tree. It would grow uh, over 100 feet in height. For some record ones going up to 10 feet in diameter. In 1904, chestnuts began to die from a strange disease of blight. In about 50 years, killing over 3 billion. And there's deep passion to restore this tree. The chestnut project is probably going to be the first time people have used genetic engineering to make a restoration tree. It's going to show how we can use modern technology to solve environmental problems. So I'm very hopeful that we can do something that has never been done in human history. We're going to bring a tree back. You know, chestnut wasn't just another tree. Uh, Ecologists today recognize it as what they call a foundation species. Wildlife would benefit from this tree. It produced a very consistent nut crop. There are a few trees that have such a powerful influence on that forest system. Make up what other species are growing in that forest. They have a huge impact on productivity of the forest. People from the Native Americans used to harvest the nuts themselves and eat them, as well as use the leaves for medicine. The early settlers adopted those practices. They were more hunter-gatherers than they were farmers. They raised a few crops for their own use, but they survived off the land. Chestnut not only helped feed them, they fed their livestock, and a big part of their diet was the wild game that was there in such abundance, and it was largely because the chestnut was there. They also utilized the wood quite a bit. The uh, wood was very straight grained, easy to work with. It was very rot resistant. Uh, they used it everything from um, the cradle to coffins, followed from cradle to grave. Farmers realized more income from the American chestnut than any other farm product. In the fall of the year, Everybody that lived in the mountains would gather sacks full of these chestnuts and take them down to the local store and barter it for things they had to have that they couldn't raise, like salt, coffee, or a new pair of shoes for the winter for the kids. And there would be train loads of chestnuts in the fall heading to the major cities of the country where they would roast them and sell them on the streets. I personally think the value of the tree has probably, uh, probably had more impact on our history than, say, the Liberty Bell or the American Eagle, both of which I treasure. But I think that tree really played an untold role in the development of this country. A little over a century ago, people started importing uh, Asian chestnut trees, mainly for orchards and for the yards and stuff. When they brought these trees over at that time, they didn't realize that they also brought all the microorganisms that were on those trees along with the tree. And it turns out there was this one fungus called Cryphonecteria parasitica that um, caused a chestnut blight. When it came here to the United States, um, it jumped off those trees onto the American chestnut and the American chestnut had never seen this fungus before and was very susceptible to it. And therefore, um, it caused very serious damage to the tree, actually killing the tree. So if you come in here, this is a typical chestnut blight canker, okay? And once that goes all the way around, it will start choking off this above part. And what happens, is this top part will probably all be wilted and will die, okay? So that's it, that's what kills the tree right there. They believe that the uh, blight started actually on Long Island, New York, and um, it was first actually described at the Bronx Zoological Park. From there, that was in 1904 and spread through the whole range within about 50 years. So by 1950s, it, it basically hit every place where there were chestnuts. From Maine to Georgia and out to Kentucky westward and pretty much all along the Appalachian Mountains. This disaster occurred kind of simultaneously with the Great Depression. Eventually it killed almost all of them. 
Luckily, it did not kill the underground portion of the tree, so it still, it still is there, but it doesn't reproduce. And uh, so I think the term we use is functionally extinct. My dad witnessed the entire chestnut story from the time of the healthy chestnut forest. In his midlife, he saw the blight begin to take effect and he saw the forest without the chestnut. So I grew up hearing these stories all my life and had a powerful influence on me. Loss of the chestnut was an American tragedy described by ecologists as the worst environmental disaster ever to strike our country. I became a forester for 42 years and uh, early in my career, I could still see the gray ghosts, the old trunks of the old dead chestnut, still standing, almost gazing down at me as I worked in the woods. And I, felt so sad about the passing of the tree. After my retirement, I'm working full time, whatever I can do to try to bring this tree back. People have been working for the past 100 years to try to uh, solve this problem of the blight and everything from uh, using fungicides to uh, making fire breaks, to try to isolate the, the blight. None of those things ever worked. So the mission is actually um, to develop a blight tolerant American chestnut tree. It's gonna be the first time people have used genetic engineering to make a restoration tree. Oxalic acid is the thing that the fungus uses to attack the tree, basically. So um, if you can get rid of that acid, the fungus no longer can attack the tree. So what we discovered was there was actually a gene that's found in many different plants called oxalate oxidase. This is a gene that actually detoxifies oxalic acid. It breaks it down. So, you know, there's a eureka moment when we discovered this is that, uh, wow, if we can just get this gene into chestnut, the, the fungus can make all the acid at once, but the tree is just gonna break it down. When you put a gene into a tree, we use a bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It's a natural genetic engineer found in the environment, it moves genes into plants, but it moves it into one cell at a time. So in order to get a whole tree, you have to regenerate a tree from that single cell. And so we have to develop the techniques to do that. So what are you working on? Well, I'm running a gel on some of the T2s. The idea is you want to get something as close to the original as possible. And that's what uh, genetic engineering allows us to do. Uh, we're not changing uh, very many genes in the tree. We're actually only adding a couple genes. And every other gene in the tree is exactly the same. What we're going to do with these, we're going to actually uh, infect them with the fungus. We're going to inoculate them. Um, we've got some of the fungus growing right here. And uh, we're going to find out um, how the gene responds to the fungus. So this is uh, one of our experimental orchards for American chestnut. And we have all kinds of chestnuts in here. We have pure wild type American. We have um, some Chinese chestnut. We have some hybrids. But most importantly, we have some of our genetically engineered trees in here. And so we're growing them out here, infecting them with the blight and determining, you know, does that really enhance blight resistance or not? So where we are right now, we've, we've developed uh, blight tolerant trees so that they can survive in, in the presence of the blight. The next step is to get through the regulatory approval because we use genetic engineering, which is a highly regulated uh, technique. Um, and that's what we're working on. This is what the Templeton Foundation is supporting us uh, for. So we're developing these uh, petitions that we're going to supply to uh, three different U.S. federal agencies uh, that will hopefully allow us to, um, to distribute the trees eventually for restoration. The big questions is how is this going to act in a forest over many decades? They want to make sure that we're going to put a tree out that is going to actually benefit the environment and not harm the environment. We also want to make sure we're not going to harm any um, non-target organisms. And that's why we test things against bees and against other insects like caterpillars and aquatic insects and, and things like that. To do each observations, I start by netting out the tadpole, which is 
kind of tricky because they move really fast, especially as they get bigger. We want to see if chestnut leaf type and specifically whether transgenic leaves have any impact on tadpole development or survival. In vernal pool ecosystems, kind of temporary ponds that form in forests, these little ponds are lined with deciduous leaves and potentially tadpoles could be uh, interacting with chestnut leaves. Templeton has allowed us to do our frog experiments just to show that our trees are no different than the wild type, except for being light resistant. In the study, we found something out that we weren't really expecting because we were also feeding the, the uh, frogs things like maple leaves, uh, beech leaves. And uh, when we looked at the development of the frogs, they actually did better on the American chestnut than let's say maple or beech. Genetic engineering is not the magic bullet. It won't solve all problems, but it should be one of the tools to be used with all the other tools in the toolbox. This is a little baby chestnut from one shoot. I got three new pieces. Last year we produced 1,800 trees, or 1,800 nuts. About uh, six to 700 of those were actually ones that have the gene in it. Um, so it's still uh, a small amount right now, but it's enough that we can do all the testing we need to do. Basically have a, enough diversity there. Getting the tree back into the forest is, is gonna be a challenge because no one has ever done this type of restoration before, it's actually going to be a century project. You're not going to get it done overnight. Um, and it's going to really rely on the public to do much of the work. We don't have the capability to go back and plant 200 million acres. But the people out here who hear this story, they can help us do that. There's a battle raging in our forest with many tree species lost to insects and diseases brought in through world trade. Chestnut was the first fallen soldier. There are many more. We've lost American elm. We are losing eastern hemlock and ash trees by the millions. With each loss of a species, our forests become less resilient. Now our forests are not healthy. People think, oh, the forests are green, they look good, but they're not healthy. There's all kinds of pests and pathogens out there, and it's only going to get worse with climate change. Restoring a tree that's been uh, functionally extinct for many decades is exciting, but uh, maybe even more meaningful in the long term is, is thinking about other plants or trees that are threatened. There's a lot of potential with the technology to address some of those other kinds of threats. It's laying a pathway for how other species can be restored. That's the bigger story, I believe. That'll be the greatest accomplishment that we can make. Mother Nature didn't decide to bring the blight here to the United States. Um, Mother Nature didn't wipe out the American chestnut tree. We are responsible for that, so we are responsible for bringing it back. We absolutely have to do this, not for ourselves, but for those that come after us. Do any of us want to leave a forest that is much poorer uh, from a diversity standpoint to our kids and grandkids? I don't think we have that right. I think that if, if this can be done, we have to do it.